On this episode of Mere Mortals, I attempt to build the fastest computer possible using the AMD FX processor. It might actually be the fastest one on the planet. Tell me, friend, when did Saruman the Wise abandon reason for madness? If you remember in my last video, I was working on upgrading an old family computer. After months of research and upgrades, I finally maxed out the computer and was very impressed by how much performance I could squeeze out of the old system. Originally, I had planned to make this one video, however there was too much to the story and I felt it deserved its own in-depth look into the technology. Also, before moving forward, I should add the disclaimer that technically this is not the fastest FX computer ever built. As of the making of this video, the current world record goes to The Stilt from Team Finland, who achieved an overclock of an astonishing 8.72 GHz. For comparison, most home desktop computers only really reach speeds of 3.5 to 4.5 gigahertz, and that's for short periods of time. Computers that are clocked for pure speed look and act completely different than a normal PC. For example, this computer is the world record holder with an FX chip. It is very bare bones and it actually only turns on, runs the benchmark, and then they turn it right back off. So it's not really a fully functioning machine. What I'm attempting to build is the fastest fully functional AMD FX computer ever. I want to take the best AMD had to offer in 2013 and blend it with technology from today in order to build a computer that would be capable of playing AAA games, watching YouTube, surfing the internet, basically anything that you would do with a computer built today. So one question you might have is why? Why use AMD FX processor, or better yet, go to the trouble of building a computer that is already obsolete? There are a few answers to these questions, and first and foremost, I took on this project because I'm curious, and I love learning. It doesn't hurt that the technology was readily available and cheap. Why the AMD FX processor? Well, I wish I could say I had some connection to it, like, when I was a kid I'd press my face up against the glass of the display case and wish I could get my hands on the world's first 5 GHz CPU. The truth is, I chose the FX processor because my original computer was an AM3 generation CPU, and I wanted to see how far that generation of processors had come. Along the way, I learned about the controversy this processor and its architecture faced when it was released. If you'd like to learn more about that, check out Gamer Nexus's video on the processor. Before we get into the build, we should talk about how I'm able to even blend this technology. The motherboard, the CPU, the RAM in this computer, they were all built 11 years ago. How am I able to build a computer and put a modern day video card or modern day hard drive into a PC this old? So in order to answer that question, we'll need to step back in time a bit to see how manufacturers solve the problem. From 1999 to about 2003, I was very much into building custom computers. At the time, most of the technology was all over the place. Manufacturers had not started to standardize the way peripherals would connect to your computer. This made building computers or upgrading desktop computers a real nightmare. By 2003, I'd grown tired of the limitations and issues I was constantly facing when building a custom computer and I decided to give it up altogether. While I was finishing up school, getting my first job, and getting married, the computer industry moved on. In 2003, Peripheral Component Interconnect Express, or PCIe, was introduced. It wasn't until four years later, in 2007, PCIe 2.0 had really matured and was fully standard across manufacturers. This standardization meant that peripheral ports used for upgrading and expanding a computer's functionalities would be able to work the same way across all manufacturers. The big advantage here is that the ports would remain forward and backward compatible, meaning that they were sort of future-proof. That if you built a computer in 2007, by 2010, 15, 2020, as long as the manufacturers stayed on that standard, everything would continue to still work. One drawback to this though, 
is if I have a newer generation video card or device for a PCIe 4 Express port, let's say, and I plug it into a PCIe 2.0, it will just run at the slower rate. It still works, just slower. When I purchased my family computer in 2010, I didn't realize it at the time, but the motherboard had PCIe 2.0 slots. This is why in 2023, when I was filming my first video, I was able to buy a modern day video card and hard drive adapter and plug them right into my ancient computer. Now that we understand why connected devices are backward compatible, let's take a look at what hardware I decided to go with. First on the shopping list was a CPU. Looking at the processors available that fit the AM3 Plus motherboards, I decided to go with the FX9590 CPU. This was a difficult processor to work with, to say the least. 9590's max operating temperature is about 58 to 60 degrees Celsius, which this processor hits immediately. When these came out, AMD didn't even offer a CPU cooler. They just told the users that this processor would require quote-unquote exotic cooling. From there, the motherboards capable of running this processor had to be a very strong VRM or voltage regulator module. This processor ran at a power supply crushing 220 watts. For a little context, the AMD Ryzen 5950X processor released in 2020 has 16 cores and 32 logical processors to this 8 core processor. And that newer processor runs at a 130 watts for comparison. So finding a motherboard that won't melt under this kind of strain was very difficult. And this leads me to the next item on the shopping list, the motherboard. Given the extreme requirements of this CPU, I spent months buying motherboards to see which one could handle the CPU and still accommodate the demands of all of the other components. Along the way, I'd find a promising motherboard, check out its capabilities, only to learn that there was some newer revision or better version that existed. So I would sell the motherboard on eBay and buy the next one. The first board I tried was the Gigabyte GA990FXA UD5. It was quick to see the CPU was too much for this board. It would overheat quickly and had very limited options in the way of overclocking. I'll explain a little bit more on overclocking later in the video. From there I tried the MSI990FXA gaming motherboard. It was a great quality board. Also it had fantastic options for overclocking. At the same time I was testing this board, I managed to find the ASRock 990FX Extreme 9 motherboard. It too had some great overclocking options, but proved to be pretty unstable when I started to push some of the limits of the configurations. I would have probably stuck with the MSI 990FX motherboard, but I decided to try one more, and it was the ASUS Sabertooth 990FX Revision 2. This was the most promising yet. It was extremely well built and had plenty of great options. Also, the VRMs were well suited for the demand of the 990FX chip. So I sold the MSI board and started work on the ASUS. When I got everything just about done and dialed in, I stumbled upon this PDF. Apparently there was one special version of the ASUS Sabertooth known as the Gen 3. What was special about this version of the motherboard is that it had PCIe 3.0 slots. Something none of the other motherboards had. Luckily, I was able to buy the Sabertooth R2 Gen 3 board, so settled on the motherboard, let's do a quick tour of the ASUS Sabertooth 990FX Revision 2 Gen 3 motherboard. Highlighted is the heavy duty VRM. Next is the special controller chip for this board. In order to achieve PCIe 3.0 on an FX processor, manufacturers would have to include this additional controller chipset to the board in order to take advantage. Now, I'm probably oversimplifying this, but my guess is that this version of the board came out a little too late in the life cycle for the processor. The first FX processors hit the market in 2011, and this motherboard didn't come along until 2013. There was, at that time, no real advantages to going PCI Express 3.0, and yet there were also a lot of cheaper options coming out with Intel that already were kind of targeting that technology. If you were building a computer in 2013, you weren't looking at the 9590 at a whopping $900 price tag versus the Intel 4770K at like 300. So 
I think that's really the big problem here with why we don't see a lot of AMD AM3 Plus motherboards that support PCI Express 3.0. There just wasn't much market share for the processor, especially after all of the controversy too on what constitutes a core. Looking at all of this now, I understand why this motherboard was so hard to find and it's so incredibly rare. It was a very limited run targeted to some very specific customers and not really meant for widespread adoption. If you remember from earlier in the video, the PCI Express ports actually play a really big part now in 2024 when I'm building this PC. Because any opportunity I can to squeeze a little more performance out of the hard drive and out of the video card will come at great benefit to this old machine. One topic I still haven't covered on PCI Express is exactly how the ports run at different speeds. So if we look at my diagram here, you can see a PCI Express 1 card only uses this portion of the slot. From there, a PCI Express 4X card would use a little bit more. When you get up to PCI Express 8 and 16, you can see 8's using half the slot and 16 will use the entire slot. This actually became one of my first roadblocks. When trying to connect an NVMe hard drive, most of the adapter cards were assuming I was on new technology and would only offer options in the 4X or the 1X variety because that was assumed that on PCI Express 4 or even 5, it would be more than enough bandwidth. But little did they know, I was trying to put together an 11-year-old computer and wanted to squeeze the most out of the hard drive. Luckily, I found this option. It uses the full 16X of the PCI Express architecture, and that meant that the hard drive would have full bandwidth to the CPU. Just to clarify here, if I'm only using PCI Express 2.0 at 4X, that's 250 megabytes per second. If I'm able to use the 16X or entire slot, that's 1000 megabytes per second and much closer to modern day speed. However, this version of the Sabertooth has PCI Express 3.0 slots, meaning the slot would be able to achieve 2000 megs per second transfer rate, which is four times faster than the hard drive connections on this motherboard. This also means that the video card should see a pretty good performance boost too. Next on the shopping list was some DDR3 memory. In fact, I was able to find 2400 megahertz RAM. This is very fast for DDR3. I was not even aware it went up to those kind of speeds. It was pretty easy to settle on a video card and hard drive too. Given my budget and that I didn't want to be dropping a $1,500 video card in my obsolete computer, so I ended up with a Radeon RX 6750 XT. This would be enough money wasted on that department. And next I picked up an 850 watt power supply because I knew the processor was pretty power hungry. The final component was just an NVMe style SSD hard drive to go inside the carrier I'd bought to go in the PCI Express slot. So I was all set until I realized I needed to cool this 9590 processor. And there was a huge problem. Manufacturers had stopped shipping their cooling products with the necessary hardware to connect to AM3 motherboards years ago. After a few weeks of research, I finally settled on the Noctua NHD15. I thought it would be kind of fun to see if I could air cool this processor, especially with its reputation of needing water cooling and exotic cooling in order to keep it from melting. I ended up purchasing two of these. I purchased one from my main computer that I do most of my video editing on, and then I picked up another one secondhand on eBay. The biggest reason I did this, if you showed proof of purchase to Noctua, they would still ship you, free of charge, the AM3 mounting hardware. They had saved the day and the build was back on. Finally, several weeks later and my parts shipped from Germany, I was ready to hook everything together and see what kind of performance I could get. Assembling the computer went well. I had no issues and managed to fit everything in my budget case. I didn't film the build because at this point I was on the 20th revision of the world's fastest AM3 computer and I was beginning to think I'd never be done. But this time things were different. Things were going good. Too good. Once assembled, I booted the computer to begin the install of Windows when I discovered a major flaw in my plans. No matter what I did, Windows would not recognize the hard drive. It took me a few hours of searching online to learn that the Gen 3 version of the Sabertooth motherboard was never given support to boot from the PCI Express slot. I was shocked. 
My other version of the Sabretooth had no issues in booting at all, nor did any of the other motherboards. In fact, my Dell even recognized the drive when connected to its PCI Express port, so I never even thought to check that this would work. The fact that booting from PCI Express was possible on other motherboards, especially the other Sabretooth, led me to question, is there a way to modify the BIOS for the Gen 3 so that I could do this? I mean, it's not a hardware limitation after all. It took another two weeks of research, reading about BIOS modding, downloading BIOS editing tools, and a lot of trial and error, but I was able to successfully mod a BIOS. I wish I had video of the first time the Windows installer showed the NVMe drive as an option to install Windows on. I knocked over my chair and ran around the house celebrating for about 10 minutes. Ironically, I found out a few days later that there was a forum post from 2020 where a BIOS modder had already done exactly what I had and put the file out there for everybody to download. I downloaded it, tried it out, and can confirm it actually works great. So, to save yourself some trouble, I put the link to the BIOS in the description below. Finally, I have a working computer. And that's where I'm going to stop this one. In the next video, I'll run it through all of the benchmarks and show some of the gameplay footage. So hopefully you enjoyed this video, and I hope you tune in for the next one. Thanks again for watching.